Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. As you can see it is still Septandy time, this time bringing you the Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 3 Microcomputer. Oh yeah. Now these types of computers have always been a tad intimidating to me because I'm always wondering how am I ever going to install software on these things. I also don't know that much about them so that makes it extra difficult. But ultimately the goal is to run some software and play some games on it. So that's what we're going to try and do today. And I'm going to show you just how easy or difficult that is. Ranging from going hardcore using actual cassettes and the included tape drive to using a more modern PC which will allow us to load up software onto the TRS-80 or wimping out completely and going full-blown emulation. But first let's take a look at the hardware of this iconic computer. I got this as a loan from a fellow retro collector just in time for Septandi who turned it on and it filled the room up with smoke so there's definitely something going on here. Now I do like the look and feel of these old computers. It has this kind of iconic shape because this is an all-in-one. It has the CRT included. Very few ports on the back. We have the cassette port and the power port. That's basically it. But if we turn the thing around so that we can look at the bottom, we see two additional ports. So from my understanding, we have a serial port as well as a parallel port. A bit oddly positioned. And here we have the Tandy sticker with the catalog number and the serial number included. Hiding away from plain sight are two dials here to control the brightness and contrast of the CRT. And on the other side we have the power button which is equally hidden away. Now the model that I have here didn't come with any floppy drives, it only came with a cassette tape player. It does have the built-in monochrome CRT display and keyboard. We can upgrade this model with one or two uh, floppy drives, but then we also need to upgrade the power supply as well. The keyboard is an improvement from previous model and has a nice clicky feel. We have a separate numeric keypad, 16 kilobytes of RAM indication and a red reset button. Now judging from the sticker, this machine isn't under warranty anymore, so I guess it is safe to open it up. There are a couple of screws on the bottom that we need to unscrew before we can get to the internals. Now opening these machines needs to be done with extreme caution and precision because the CRT is part of the top assembly and the neck of the CRT could get tangled in one of the cables on the bottom part. So you need to be extremely careful lifting it up. As soon as you feel any friction you need to pull it down again. Because it's a very tight fit in that area next to the power supply where the neck of the CRT kind of slides in. And the power supply has an issue here because uh, the guy who gave it to me said that he turned it on, it filled up with smoke and then he turned it off. And it's one of those reefer caps here, one of those safety capacitors that blew. Now the machine can run without it, so I will be replacing it, but I'm fairly certain that the machine will turn on right now because it has popped open and this machine can run uh, pretty much without it. On the back we have the motherboard including the iconic Z80 CPU clocked at 2 MHz. This unit here has 16 kilobytes of RAM and we have two additional banks of memory that we can fill to give it a total of 48 kilobytes. Now upon hitting the power on switch you don't hear anything because there is no fan in the system. But after a while the CRT started glowing up and we noticed something on the screen. So putting it in a more comfortable position, let's start up the machine right now. As we know, it probably won't explode. We get the cassette and memory size prompt and we are dropped into a basic prompt. So we can execute basic commands. And now the goal will be to install some software on this. And in order for us to do that, we need to take a look at this. So this is the Radio Shack TRS-80 cassette recorder. Now because the model that I have here didn't come with any floppy drives, we need to resort to these cassette tapes to load software onto the device and to write software onto uh, tapes as storage. So we'll take a closer look at this one in a bit. 
Now I only have the tape drive, I don't have the cable that goes with it. And the cable is a 5 pin DIN connector which uses 3 uh, mono jacks on the other side. You can get them off of eBay for relatively cheap or you can decide to make one yourself. As these three mono plugs need to plug into the jacks here on the side. So we have the power, but we also have an earphone output, which is used to get data from the tape on the computer. We have an aux port that you can use to hook up an amplified speaker to get some sound out of your TRS-80. We have a remote control jack here, which is the smaller one. And then we have the microphone jack. So with your TRS-80 cable, you get three uh, mono plugs. One is a 2.5 millimeter, which is for the remote control. It goes into this plug here. And this allows the TRS-80 to control the tape reel movements. So when you hit play, for example, you'll notice that the cassette isn't moving at all. It's unless the TRS-80 gives a proper instruction to start playing the tape that it will actually uh, rotate the reels. And then the other one goes into the earphone jack of the tape drive so that we can get stuff from the tape on the computer. And the other one goes into the microphone jack. So this is when we want to save stuff from the computer onto a tape. Now I was kind of anxious to try this one out because I had a lot of old audio tapes that I still wanted to hear. And I thought this thing would have like a built-in speaker and it would just allow me to, you know, put an audio tape in and hear some uh, sound coming out of the speakers, but that wasn't really the case. As proven by this Nirvana tape from the early 90s, which doesn't produce any sound at all. Now, I was happy to see that the reels were moving as I was playing around with the piano keys here. So the fast forward, rewind, play seems to work fine. So that's already good news. I did clean the heads a little bit with some isopropyl alcohol, but that didn't fix things either. I still didn't get any sound from the internal speaker. So I decided to hook up my external speakers. Now I know that the alternative metal sound from the US band Helmet isn't the most easy on the ears, but it did sound a whole lot better when I was young. So I decided to use a more soothing tone, Heather Nova this time. But yeah, still very distorted, lots of noise in the background, so I thought that this would never be able to read or write software. But without a proper cassette cable, I would never get software on this thing. So that was the next plan. So I had these cables here, which had 2.5 millimeter and 3.5 millimeter uh, mono plugs on them. And I also got this five pin uh, DIN connector assembly here, which I could solder some wires on. So that was my next plan. So here you can see the five pins that we need to hook up and that will ultimately go into our TRS-80. So this should be a relatively easy task to assemble a cable. So I started by cutting the mono plug cables here, splitting them, uh, stripping them, pulling the cables through this housing here. Important to do that up front. And then it's just a matter of wiring them up in the correct way. And there's lots of documentation out there on the internet on how to create such a cassette cable. So I just went with that, soldered on the wires, made sure that I didn't have any shorts, doing some basic continuity checks, before finally assembling this five pin DIN plug. So that's pretty easy enough You just hold the three cables uh, together here. We add the top part of the assembly and then finishing it off by pulling this thing over the connector so that we get a nice clean fit. And there we have it. A new TRS-80 cassette cable is born. Okay, so now that I have a cable and a cassette player, I don't have any cassettes containing software. So that's a bit of an issue. 
But luckily we have a basic prompt here and I can write a little basic program. So this is probably something that most of you developer or not has already done at least once in a lifetime. And I'm going to try and save this on a tape. So I hit the record and play button. The tape drive will not move. I will enter the C save command, give it a name. Only the first letter is used, so I'm just going to use one. And as soon as I hit enter, you will see the tape moving and the TRS-80 will save my little basic program on the tape. And as soon as it's finished, the tape will stop. And if we want to hear what the basic program sounds like, we can hook it up to an external speaker and give it a listen. Now a couple of lessons learned, always use a blank tape or record something blank over an existing tape before saving a program. And also look at the indicator to see where your program is located on the tape and start playing from there. So that was it, two lines of basic code blasting through the speakers. Now with a rebooted TRS-80 here with no program running, Let's load up our tape and issue the cload command to load up the basic program into the TRS-80. Now this won't take very long, so you can see it's already ready. And if we do a list, we can see the program that was stored on the tape and is now running on the TRS-80. Now as much as I appreciate the hardcore aspect of using real tapes and a tape drive like this, I can understand that for most people this is going to be quite a hassle and I want something easier. Now for those people a modern laptop can come to the rescue as that laptop is also perfectly capable of producing the sound that the TRS-80 needs in order to load a program. And PlayCAS is a small Windows application that does just that. So with it you can open up a cassette file which is a virtual cassette and when you load up the CAS file in the Play CAS application, here you can see the basic application which is embedded in this cassette file. And what you can do right now is you can actually play this file. Now when you hit the play button and this is blasting through your speakers, you will hear a similar sound as you heard previously when I hooked up the tape recorder to an external drive. But we're not going to do that obviously because we're going to be hooking up our laptop to the TRS-80 using our cassette cable. So that means that when we prep the TRS-80 and we issue the C load command, the only thing we need to do now is have PlayCast play the file. So we select the cassette file, hit play, and it will stream the audio straight into the TRS-80 where it will be picked up. Unfortunately, this is happening at the same speed as a cassette would play, but at least it gives you the opportunity to load big basic programs on your TRS-80 without fiddling around with cassette tapes. So here we can see the application running, which is a chart plotting application showing some graphs on the screen. Now I've already showed you that you can store basic programs on a cassette, either virtually or on the cassette itself. but a cassette can also contain machine code. For example, this Space Invader file here isn't created in BASIC, but it's created in machine language. But the same can be stored on a cassette as well. Notice that it has a name called Invade. And to load up this cassette on the TRS-80, we don't use the CLOAD command, but instead we issue the system command. Now we will get a prompt where we need to enter the name of the application that we want to run. And the name here is invade, but it only uses the first letter. So we type I and then it will search for that particular program on the tape. This will take a while, so I'm going to speed up this footage. But after a while, it will give you another prompt. And when you hit slash, it will run the actual program in this case, Space Invader. Now, for those who want to go into the emulation route, we have TRS-32, which is an excellent TRS-80 emulator supporting a variety of different models. Obviously, you will need to have access to the ROMs. So I have a Model 1 and a Model 3 ROM here. And inside the emulator, you need to specify the ROM path. So I'll do that right now. 
And then after a reboot, we should no longer have this ROM image not found, but instead we will get a black screen. And that's the default behavior of the TRS-80. If you have a TRS-80 with a disk drive and you don't have a disk inserted, you will get a blank screen. Now, luckily you can download lots of disk images for the TRS-80. For example, here on Terry Stewart's web zone for classic computers, there are lots of disk images for the TRS-80. New DOS, for example, is a boot disk that I will download now. And I will also download Zork, the famous game from Infocom, which runs on the TRS-80. So I will add a floppy disk and I will pick the new DOS boot disk. And as soon as I do that, it will prompt me to reboot the emulator. And with the beautiful sounds included, which is a nice touch, we get the new DOS boot. I will insert the Zork disk and when I issue the dir command followed by column 1, I will get the content of the Zork disk. Now when I issue the Zork command, it will execute the Zork application on the floppy disk and we will enter the game. Now take into account this is a 2 MHz CPU so it takes a bit of time. And after a little bit, we should see the Zork startup screen where we can start the game. Now, if we launch the emulator with the Model 3 settings, we get a diskette prompt when we boot the system without a disk. Now, if we disable the floppy drives, as is the case with my system, it should behave just the same as my real TRS-80. So when I restart, I get the cassette prompt. I hit L, I hit enter on the memory size, and it drops me into basic, just like it did on the real Model 3 that I have here. And just like we did on the real TRS-80, we can brush up our basic skills, run a few programs and we even have a virtual cassette tape drive where we can insert cassette tapes you know the cas files that i used in the play cas well the same files can be run here so we can pop up our cassette recorder which has loaded our cas file right now we hit play issue the c load command and it should load the basic application which is on the cassette just like it did on the play cast scenario and just like it would do when you would load it from an actual tape. So here we have the application loaded and we can run it on the emulator. I'm sure this looks pretty familiar. And that leads us to the end of this video. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. I definitely did and learned a bunch of new tips and tricks for this TRS-80. Uh, I was happy to see the tape drive working. It has uh, quite a nostalgic effect to uh, load programs from these tapes and, and write programs to it. So yeah, that's really cool. The fact that you can use more modern technology to get data and applications onto the TRS-80 is also a plus. And I've noticed that there is excellent emulation support and there's a great TRS community online where you can ask a bunch of questions and lots of people will be happy to help you out. So with that being said, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please consider giving it a thumbs up or consider subscribing to the channel and I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.